A very warm and good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of Satyavati College, on behalf of Satyavati College, which is part of Delhi University and Rethinking Economics in the organization, I welcome you all to session two of this conference titled Critical Perspectives on Current Teaching and Learning Processes of Indian Economics Education. This, in this session, where we focus on teaching and learning aspects of economics as a subject within Indian universities. These aspects are critical as students carry forward the learnings from the class and employ the lessons learned in the professional domains, in the professional domains of research and policy making. The real implications of research and the effects of policies implemented make it imperative that the students of economics have a balanced and critical view of all aspects of the subject, which allows a richer perspective on economic issues. This session is chaired by Dr. Deepa Sinha, a person who straddles the worlds of academic teaching and research with equal aplomb. Welcome Dr. Deepa Sinha. She teaches at Ambedkar University, which is based out of Delhi and is well known for her work on issues related to food rights, nutrition and public health. To her credit, she has authored several books and articles in academic journals and remains a leading authority on these issues. And it is an honor for us to have her with us. In this session, we will have five speakers who will be presenting their papers here. And we have attempted to mix researchers along with teachers, keeping in mind the theme of the session. The first paper, the first speaker is by Meeta Kumar who is part of Miranda House, uh, which is part of Delhi University. And she will be talking about history and historiography in the pedagogy of economics. She will be followed by Rahul Menon, who is an independent researcher. And he will be talking about accumulation and distribution in Joanne Robinson. This is followed by an eminent speaker, Amex, Alex M. Thomas, who is from Azim Premji University with his take on the competing views on pluralism economics. The fourth speaker is Sunil Dharan, who is again from Delhi University, and he'll be talking about teaching tax theory at undergraduate level of teaching. Last but not the least, our speaker is Bibek Ranj, uh, Rajak from Dayal Singh College, Delhi University, and he'll be talking about economic thoughts of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, over to you, Deepa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ankur. And thank you uh, for all the organizers at Satyavati College and Rethinking Economics uh, for inviting me and even more so for organizing this very important seminar, uh, which I think gives us, uh, it begins this process of something that all of us individually and in our little groups are thinking about all the time on how uh, while we work in these universities and have our course curriculums to make the uh, economics education that we transact to our students more relevant and at the same time make spaces uh, for pluralism, for heterodox economics, uh, and how we sometimes have to grapple with. I was thinking when I got this also, for instance, this semester I was teaching the first introductory economics course for the undergraduate students uh, and uh, the principles of economics and how one had to use the mainstream established textbooks, which from the first page are in between lines repeatedly saying how the market is the best way to make decisions and so on while using the textbook to introduce students to be able to question that idea was quite a challenge uh, especially for young students straight from school uh, so something very very relevant for all of us something again that i have personally also been grappling with given the multiple worlds that i try to uh, have my feet in so for somebody who was out of the university system for over 10 years and then came back, uh, how does one relate the experience that one has had uh, in policy and advocacy in working on economic issues and then being in this academic space where somehow it seems as if they're two different worlds sometimes. Uh, whereas uh, definitely we know from our scholarship, all of us in this 
uh, session and so on, that they are not two different worlds. I mean, the whole point of economics is to understand this other world that we live in and uh, work in. Uh, so I really do hope that this is just a beginning of a longer process of uh, discussion on how we can reform economics education uh, in India. And when we do that, of course, also while we go into the different areas uh, of uh, teaching and research and that we'll be hearing and the gaps that there are in the current way in which it's being transacted, also thinking of the larger context of what is happening in higher education in the country, like we were discussing before the session began as well. Uh, and looking at how these changes that are taking place can be seen both as challenges as well as opportunities. So for instance, the new education policy and many of us are now in the process of uh, changing to the four-year program, revising our courses. So how do we use this as an opportunity to build in a different kind of approach? At the same time, with the constraints of things like CBCS and somewhere is feeling that things are being handed down to us uh, uh, with uh, things becoming more and more centralized. Um, looking at the context in which students are coming from, the class sizes, the class infrastructure, and I think also the division between the public and the private university spaces, uh, which is all something that uh, is coming up so much more now, uh, which in this context of NEP, how does it play out? And I hope it doesn't end up being a situation where uh, those of us in the public universities have uh, lesser space to be creative and to work around uh, things while even for those kind of uh, academic activities, uh, public universities become restricted uh, kind of spaces just so I think a, a lot depends on how this NEP is actually implemented and uh, uh, interpreted and how we look at addressing why we look at uh, what we want to teach students also uh, look at how we can do that to students who come from these various kind of uh, constraints of language of uh, their own economic uh, situation, access to books, access to various other kinds of material and so on. Uh, so therefore, again, once again, I hope that this, this uh, process of discussion that has been started in the seminar would uh, give us more and more opportunities to do this. It's definitely not something that can all be addressed in uh, one uh, conference or seminar. Uh, so I will not speak very much more and uh, I hope that we'll have enough time for the presentation as well as the discussions. So without uh, much further uh, ado, I think we should just start with the panel. The first speaker will be uh, Meeta, Meeta Kumar from Miranda House in Delhi University. She's speaking on the history and historiography in the pedagogy of uh, economics. Meeta? Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. And Please tell me if it's visible. Yeah, we can see the screen. Maybe you can start the, make it full screen. Um, so let me begin by uh, congratulating the organizers as Deepa's done on this very topical uh, conference, especially as we discuss the shape of syllabi under the NEP. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to organize my own thoughts on a subject that, that's actually quite close to my heart, uh, but I haven't really articulated it in this manner. Uh, I will, I promise not to take too long and I uh, plan to divide my comments into uh, three broad uh, areas. So I'll spend the first few minutes talking about uh, where I stand regarding the purpose of education in general. And uh, just a second. Can you, can you, do you see this funny bar? Okay. That is that. Um, right, and the, the second thing that I uh, want to talk about is, presentation, not me. Yeah. Um, is, is really does uh, the role of history in economics and does history have uh, useful economics uh, in any sense? And then the, very briefly, I'll turn to uh, historiography and the interaction between history and, and uh, empirics. Uh, each of these uh, 
is is a topic that deserves a certain amount of uh, time and uh, and we don't have that so we'll do the best with what we have um okay so what is the purpose of education what is the objective of education the way i see it uh, broadly uh, the purpose of education could be instrumentalist where you provide skills for self improvement it, you know the kind of thing that olson was talking about where you talk where when you increase your marketable human capital in a certain sense alternatively um, the value uh, you know the purpose of education could be intrinsic where you uh, just want to improve uh, let's say uh, the mental horizons uh, for its own sake and um, so in, in that case, the uh, increase in marketable human capital becomes a corollary of the process. Okay. Uh, in the formal system, a formal system, what you are, what the education system will try and do is to pour into the learner specialized knowledge and skills. And what the latter requires is to equip the learner with a curiosity and the means to enlarge that curiosity. Okay, clearly the methods uh, involved and the outcomes are likely to be different. I hold with the latter because, uh, and I quote, a liberal education provides the terrain for investigating the blends and clashes of many voices. Okay, uh, basically the citizen as a radical, the citizen as a arguer, the citizen as storyteller, the citizen as a service learner, the citizen as a bureaucrat, and uh, so many other roles that a citizen is expected to play. Now, in the world as it stands today, um, what is demanded of a student is actually, I think, two very uh, sort of basic things. One is the ability to uh, negotiate and to hear, first of all, and to negotiate the blends and clashes of many voices. And the second is the ability to upgrade this skill set that the, the student has and reinvent them oneself uh, in, in very often very short durations of time. Now, um, given that, uh, what role does a liberal uh, approach have in the teaching of economics. And here I'd like to um, quote uh, Jean Tirole uh, when, you know, when, he, when he's concluding in the concluding sort of paragraphs of uh, economics for the common good, uh, he exhorts economists to guide their countries through a period of low growth, prepare them for the digital revolution uh, in, in its many socioeconomic challenges, uh, design solutions to it, the problems of employment, climate change, financial regulation, monopolies, poverty and inequality, and so on. Now, central to any economist's ability to do this is, of course, rigorous research. Okay. But that's only one part of the story. Equally important is the ability to communicate across disciplines. And this is something that Deepa was talking about. Um, I believe that actually jargon serves a very important role in easing communication within the discipline. So when I speak to a fellow economist about quasi concave preferences or a Bob Douglas function or a Nash equilibrium, I expect to be understood unambiguously. But not so when I'm talking to a politician or a bureaucrat or a policymaker. So a liberal approach is essential to teach students not to mistake the rhetoric of economics for the science of economics. And it is essential to appreciate the appropriateness of jargon in certain conversations and its inappropriateness in others. Moreover, it is essential to equip young economists with the vocabulary to communicate with non-economists. Okay, many of the uh, greatest contemporary economists have actually uh, figured this out. I mean, if, if, if you look at something like Why Nations Fail or Poor uh, Economics, these are books that a lay person can pick up and read and understand, okay, without really uh, compromising on the 
uh, theoretical rigor of where they are coming from. Okay. Um, in fact, Keynes once said that the master economist should examine the present in the light of the past for purposes of the future. And yet, at the Delhi University, for example, we've had to fight, fight quite hard to retain history-based papers in the curriculum. And in this, as in much else, we seem to be taking our cue from the, from the US. In, in a paper way back in 1976, uh, McCloskey actually lamented the uh, fall in demand for history among economists. Uh, so no self-respecting economist, uh, she points out, would admit to ignorance of mathematics with the same facetiousness as she would uh, admit to an ignorance of history. We all know that mathematical models have an advantage in making explicit exactly what um, economists want to communicate. Uh, economists for, uh, similarly has a, has, has a role uh, in sort of separating, let's say, causation from forbearance. As a method of communication within the community, it's easy to see the comparative advantage of mathematics and econometric, right? Uh, the, the economies of scale in a certain sense are, are clearly visible. Uh, so there's a reason uh, where, for the progressive mathematization, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, for economics, uh, of, of economics there. To quote Roderick, for example, there's no need uh, for endless debates on what exactly Samuelson or Arrow had in mind, unlike earlier authors like Keynes or Marx or Schumpeter. Right? But having said that, uh, I can list at least at least um, four reasons why history is equally important to the discourse. And the first has to do with the fact that it provides us with information that can be used to validate or negate theory, much in the vein of what Professor Patnaik was saying earlier this afternoon. Okay, so there are spec uh, skeptics who believe that historical data is likely to be less amenable to the use of economic tools of analysis, but I don't believe that. I see no reason to believe that estimates of parameters thrown up by historical data will have systematically larger errors or that distributions will have systematically larger variances uh, just because they pertain to historical data. Uh, over the last uh, few decades, in any case, much creativity and computing have gone into generating data sets that are perfectly amenable to the use of standard tools of economics. Uh, the second, McCloskey argues, and I agree, uh, that temporal distance allows a certain perspective. The dead, she says, as objects of study, yield facts richer in many dimensions than modern facts. So one of the examples for, uh, is, uh, that, that I can cite here is uh, this whole uh, drain of wealth and colonial extraction uh, kind of thing. Now, what we, we do know with hindsight is that uh, colonial extraction was a much more, um, much more complex and perhaps a much more deeper process uh, than, than uh, perhaps the other by uh, uh, imagined it. Okay, so um, the, the third thing that I'd like to sort of just uh, hint at is that history provides natural experiments. Now, as anyone who's read Freakonomics, for example, will have figured out, all the random control trials uh, that can generate empirical resources. History, I believe, generates far more authentic experiments. And we can, can use this, those experiments. Uh, you know, for example, um, there, there's this very interesting, um, very old study by Schultz, where he looks at uh, the marginal productivity of, uh, of land. Uh, in uh, after the 1919 demographic uh, uh, demographic shock, right, and and the kind of uh, literature that it generated, okay, and fourthly, um, you know, there's there's a very large literature in pedagogy that stresses the importance of diversity in the undergraduate school, 
especially from the perspective of identity formation amongst the, the young. Now, um, the focus of a lot of this literature is typically socio-political diversity. And I believe that um, diversity in theoretical perspectives is equally important. Uh, the ability to examine a phenomenon using multiple lenses is a valuable tool to have in a rapidly changing world. I also believe that history-based papers allow students to develop the skill by exposing them to debates, which are often very, very often not settled debates, which are still unresolved. And they also have the, uh, the, the sort of double advantage of encouraging intellectual accommodation. Um, now, finally, um, I'd like to make a couple of comments on historiography. Again, I'll be very, very, very brief here, and the framing of uh, syllabi. Now, like any social science, economics remains a discordant discipline. But to quote Tyrol once again, um, there is much that economists actually agree upon. We all know that it's impossible to pour into any syllabus a complete set of issues pertaining to an, any topic. But I think what is what might be sufficient is to pique curiosity by exposing students to the state of the debate and how, um, how important rigor in, in methodology is. So it has to be about raising the right questions rather than giving the right answers. Um, as, as economists, again, I can't resist this, as economists, what we bring to the, the historical table is really um, uh, geometrics in a certain sense. And I'd like to quote, um, quote McCloskey once again, just because her style is just so inimitable. Um, so what she says is, um, geometricians ignored the task of persuading uh, their doubting colleagues and directed their rhetorical energies instead towards non-economists, chiefly historians. This choice of audience had the advantage of import, uh, imparting emotional cohesion to the geometricians, filling them with enthusiasm and energy of convinced imperialists. The result was a series of conquests beginning in the late 1950s and widening uh, further each year um, that sharply revised American economic history and has begun to revise other economic histories around the world. Now, this includes, by the way, uh, McCluskey's own work on, on British economic history and, and the kind of work that we've seen recently on Indian economic history. But, being intellectual imperialists, however, the cleometrician forgot, as many imperialists do, that foreign adventures require domestic support. And by neglecting to solicit it, they lost. Now, this, this, this piece was written in 1976, but since then, advances in computing, as well as in economic and econometric theory, have uh, allowed some of this lost ground to be sort of reclaimed and some of the uh, domestic support to uh, research. But the point that I want to make is empires, to extend McCloskey's metaphor, don't simply melt away, right? They have to be confronted and they have to be contested. Intellectual empires can only be contested with intellectual inputs. And the brief of any curriculum, therefore, has to be to foster such a pro process. Uh, so while I, you know, I would, I would very strongly advocate the use of, um, of theory, and uh, particularly econometric theory and, and mainstream theory. Because theory, I, I believe, has advanced sufficiently over the last couple of decades to allow us a very um, powerful toolkit to revise some of the positions. For example, the kind of positions that uh, Professor Patnaik was uh, asking, asking us to revise. 
the thing is we now have the ability to do that very often using mainstream academics and that is what i, I think um, any sort of syllabus has to excite students to do uh, and in the end actually i want to leave you uh, with with these images from you know from the very bible of orthodox economics which is samuelson's textbook economics meeta can you uh, reshare your screen something's wrong with it we can't uh, see the slides probably oh did you, did you not see any slides no so it got stuck in the first slide right throughout oh i'm so, oh, oh 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 okay maybe you can stop sharing and share again yeah yeah i'll share again no that's so sad all my all my uh we yeah, didn't want to uh, yeah disturb you well yeah, you could you could just have yeah because uh, but you stopped me at a good time okay can you see the screen now uh, i can't oh you can't okay let me try again what about now yes okay so uh, let me quickly uh, run through the there there are very few slides so i'll just uh, can you see it can you see the slide yeah. yes okay yes. Uh, let me just uh, i think most of this uh, nothing was much was lost actually by not being able to see the screen except this lovely quote from mcclosky which i'd want people to read uh, and of course uh, these this last set of pictures that i want to show you which are actually from the preface of samuelson's um, economics you know the, the standard samuelson nordhaus economics uh, this was the 11th edition and i discovered it as a first year in uh, while i was browsing the library uh, in in my college and um it, this has this is something that has affected me profoundly uh, all of you i mean many of you might know this from wittgenstein uh, samuelson was using wittgenstein but this is uh, what it is so this is a picture and the question that is asked is what you see you see rabbits or Do you see ducks? Deepa, is it visible? Is the slide visible? Yeah, the slide is visible, but your voice was breaking. Yeah. Oh well. Um, so the so uh, do I need to repeat myself? I mean, this comes from Samuelson's preface. Yeah. And uh, the question is: Do you see rabbits or do you see ducks? Right. but there's more to the story if i change the aspect and broaden the frame you might actually see antelopes so much depends upon the uh, your own perspective and the frameworks that you are using to uh, to analyze particular issues let me stop there because this is basically the point uh, that i wanted to make uh, at you know that frames of reference are very very important and history has a very important role to play in providing us with those frames of reference i think also in the context of what professor patnayak was saying earlier thank you i'd like to stop there thank you thank you uh, meeta for the excellent uh, presentation i'm sorry about the slides but i think uh, i mean we were all engaged and i didn't want to disturb you so uh, thank you for raising so many again relevant uh, issues which i think will come up there's already one question but i think we'll take the questions uh, at the end of uh, the panel Okay. but many issues many things that you raised resonated uh, i think in terms of just the absence of space for history in teaching of economics 
uh, and something you said about how rhetoric is not equivalent to the science of economics. I think that's a very important, profound point, which uh, we, we face that challenge as well. So uh, I'll uh, be, let's just move to the next speaker. It's uh, Rahul Menon next, uh, and he's speaking about accumulation and distribution in John Robinson. Yeah, hi, thanks Deepa. Uh, let me just share my screen. I hope it's visible. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, thank you to the chair. Uh, thanks to everyone at uh, Rethinking Economics for <clears throat> giving me the, um, you know, for giving me this space to present my work. Uh, I would like also to thank the Rethinking Economics group for being very generous with their time and accommodating a very uh, sort of a last minute uh, request on my end. Um, my work, my talk today is basically going to be on the question of the elasticity of substitution and distribution and the writings of Joan Robinson with regard to it for many reasons. Um, those of us, uh, we, we all know that the elasticity of substitution plays a very significant role in textbook pedagogy as being one of the determinants of uh, inequality or determinants of income distribution in the mainstream model. Uh, it's also taken on added relevance in recent times because the entire debate that was happening around Thomas Piketty's work centered around the elasticity of substitution. Uh, people like Lauren Summers were saying that, you know, uh, Piketty's work, for Piketty's assumptions that inequality is going to rise in the future, you need a value of the elasticity of substitution greater than, uh, greater than one. So far, all measurement has that the elasticity of substitution is lesser than one. Therefore, Piketty's work, Piketty's hypothesis of increasing inequality will not come to bear. So therefore it plays a very important role and it in mainstream analysis of inequality and we do need to interrogate it. Now, why am I talking about Joan Robinson in this respect? Because Joan Robinson along with uh, John Hicks was one of the people who first introduced the concept into, uh, into economics and actually has done a lot of work in establishing mainstream neoclassical fundamental concepts of the theory of distribution. It's actually pretty interesting, but we can have a discussion of that later on. I don't want to go into her contributions to uh, the standard theory of distribution. Not only did she provide these concepts, she also critiqued it very significantly. After her 1950s work, where she criticized the production function, she criticized neoclassical economics. She actually had a very different theory of distribution to the one that she had uh, introduced before. So the purpose of my talk is to very briefly sketch out her criticisms of this very important concept and to also open the door slightly to what she thought the study of inequality should look like. So very, very briefly uh, to just I'll go quickly over the initial slide. Um, <coughs> standard, <coughs> very sorry, standard theory tells us that the elasticity of substitution is sigma. If sigma is lesser than one, the wage share rises with accumulation or an increase in the capital to labor ratio and vice versa. If sigma is greater than one, then, then, then with an increase in the capital to labor ratio, the share of profits will rise. This was initially given by Hicks, who spoke about it in his book, The Theory of Wages, and also spoken about by Joan Robinson in her 1933 work on the economics of imperf imperfect competition. What is very interesting to the modern reader is how modern Joan Robinson's definition is, how close it is to today's textbook definitions. When she said that the elasticity of substitution is the proportionate change in the factor ratio divided by the proportionate change in the marginal productivities ratio or in perfect competition, factor price ratio. Um, Hicks actually wrote in 1970 that if <clears throat> this expression was meant to measure substitutability along an isoquant, Joan Robinson ought to have had the sole right to the elasticity of substitution. It's a very interesting point. It's a, it's a deplorable point that her contributions to the textbook theory have been ignored, but perhaps it's for the better because she would not like to see herself associated with this given the revolution in economic theory that she brought about. Now to jump into it, what was her criticisms? I'm not going to go into the whole history of the capital critique and the myriad theoretical 
debates and disagreements that happened with it. I'm going to keep it simple just for the purpose of this lecture. Now, if the elasticity of substitution measures the sort of changes in marginal productivity ratios as we move along the production function, and if these marginal physical productivities measure factor price ratios, we are essentially saying that the elasticity of substitution can tell us how the wage to profit ratio changes as we move along the curve and thus give us an idea of uh, how inequality is changing. Now, the first problem, how do we measure the value of capital as we move along a production function, right? We cannot aggregate stocks of machines together. We cannot say capital consists of five computers and six bulldozers. It makes no sense. We have to bring it down to a value. The problem is, first, the value of capital depends upon the rate of profit. Because if we're talking about the value of capital, the value of a computer, it depends on the rate of profit to the manufacturer. So the value of capital depends upon the rate of profit. But if the rate of profit depends upon marginal productivity, there is a circularity because now the rate of profit depends upon the value of capital. So there is an essential circularity here. The, the value of capital depends on the rate of profit. The rate of profit depends upon the value of capital. So initially, you can see a problem with the notion of the elasticity of substitution. If you're defining it, saying that the marginal productivity is equal to factor price ratios, there is a circularity in here because you cannot keep the value of capital separate from the rate of profit. The two are linked because a computer, if you consider it as capital, its value inculcates a certain profit to the manufacturer. So that's the first one that she gives and says, therefore you can't, I mean, I'm drawing from it to say, why is the elasticity of substitution not suitable for understanding distribution? Because there is an essential circularity here. The second question is the role of investment. Assume, again, this is something that she had a problem with, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just say, assume you're moving along a production function at different points. Now, at each point, the assumption is that full employment is maintained at all points in time. As you move along a production function, full employment is maintained. But how can you be so sure that investment is forth enough investment is forthcoming at all points of time to keep the economy at full employment. Mainstream neoclassical theory assumes that it happens, assumes that the interest rates and monetary policy will change, etc. Assumes that substitution will happen very easily to maintain full employment. But Robinson says, following from Keynes, this is the basic idea of the Keynesian revolution to say, you cannot assume investment is coming at all points of time to maintain full employment. And once you do that, it becomes very difficult to use mainstream uh, neoclassical theory. For instance, assume uh, that you have a round of Harrod neutral technical progress, right? Harrod neutral technical progress basically says that at the same capital to output ratio, the rate of profit is productivity has risen. The wage rate has also risen in the same proportion and factor shares are constant. So imagine that suddenly all workers are becoming twice as productive. Um, their wages rise twice. The rate of profit stays constant. Output has increased. But what ensures that enough capital accumulation takes place to keep the capital output ratio constant in the new position as compared to the old position? Now, the elasticity of substitution in the mainstream theory of uh, distribution assumes that you're moving along the factor, uh, along the production function smoothly, maintaining full employment at all times. But Robinson says that explanation assumes that capitalists are always investing, and you cannot assume that so easily. You have to understand why that's happening. And this opens the door to Keynesian theories of distribution, which, uh, which posits investment as a factor that determines distribution. You cannot use the elasticity of substitution to say this is what is going to happen to um, inequality in the future. You have to understand how much of investment is forthcoming at all points of time to, to understand what is happening in the future to factor shares. Let me sort of uh, elaborate on that. 
a golden age robinson characterized the golden age as a situation where the capital output ratio is constant productivity is rising wage rates are rising in equal proportion to productivity the rates of profits are constant and factor shares are constant those of us who you know um, i mean the textbook theory of distribution tells us that this requires that either you have what is known as labor augmenting technical change or the production function is cobb douglas with an elasticity of substitution equal to 1 if you have sigma equal to 1 and you are having labor augmenting progress all of this is satisfied what robinson says is that if you reduce it to these parameters of a production function you are severely underestimating what exactly is happening with the economy for instance if the economy has to be maintained at full employment all of these things have to be satisfied entrepreneurs have to be taking enough investment to maintain growth at the natural rate too fast the economy overheats too slow unemployment occurs real wages have to be rising fast enough to ensure all output is sold so either money wages are rising or prices are falling therefore you cannot have monopolies that stop the fall in prices you cannot you cannot have monopsinies to halt the rise in money wages and we know that in the modern world we see both you cannot have union pressures that push wages at a very fast rate as the economy is approaching full employment so what robinson is saying is that basically because the and that is why she called it a golden age because she's saying this is mythical you're never going to have all of these processes happening at the same time to ensure you have smooth growth the elasticity of substitution is saying that all of this will happen if the elasticity of substitution equals 1 is negating the social institutional and technical uh, structures that make up a capitalist economy what is the nature of science that brings out these new innovations what is the nature of investment by capitalists do are they foreseeing better um, prospects in the future what is the nature of the market is it a monopoly is it a monopsony what is the nature of labor unions all of these are important to understand distribution now it's not that robinson did not think that there was a role to play she did believe that and this is this is very interesting she said that the elasticity of substitution expresses a certain kind of potential for the economy to grow it doesn't determine distribution it expresses a potential assume an economy where all wages are saved uh, sorry all wages are consumed that it is wages that are completely consumed so con the share of consumption in an economy is equal to wages all profits are saved savings equals investment the share of investment in an economy is therefore equal to the share of profits so the share of wages and profits will change depending upon the share of consumption and investment so robinson says assume that the capital to labor ratio rises okay you have a round of capital deepening accumulation occurs that raises the capital to labor ratio assume now that real wages rise as a result of this output also rises but assume that real wages rise in a smaller proportion than output now because all wages are consumed this means consumption rises in a smaller proportion than output so what happens to that remaining output how is it going to get consumed in this sense investment share has to rise to ensure that all the output is consumed so what robinson is saying is that she is saying that this is an economy which sigma is greater than 1 but it's not determined by a production function sigma being greater than 1 tells you that this economy has a situation where real wages will always rise in a smaller proportion than output and if it has to be maintained at full employment the share of investment has to rise it doesn't tell you what will happen she's saying sigma doesn't tell you what will happen sigma is basically telling you how much the share of investment has to rise in an economy in order to maintain full employment it gives you an index of the possibilities of this economy to accumulate capital and uh, to accumulate capital and maintain full employment it talks about the relation of real wage rise and out rising output per head so an economy with sigma is, that is greater than 1 is one that has the potential of moving to more mechanized techniques 
with only a small rise in real wages the share of investment in income and profits has to keep rising to prevent unemployment so it's talking about a potential and this potential could be social as well in an economy where unions are very are very weak and the pace of technological progress is very very fast real wages can rise very slowly even though output per head is rising very fast and if you have to maintain full employment the share of investment and profits has to rise if sigma is lesser than 1 the ability to move to more mechanized techniques is very difficult and it can only happen with wages rising in a greater proportion than output the share of investment in income has to fall to maintain full employment if there's too much investment you can have overheating and you're not at full employment and basically this is valid only in the case of full employment so it's an abstract conception of the economy what actually has to be studied are investment and in institutions robinson's idea is to say that sigma is not a determinant of uh, inequality it is an expression of the potential of this economy to um, to accommodate more investment and more profits if it has to maintain full employment in a situation of capital deepening how much can output per head rise how much will real wages rise if output per head rises how much should investment increase in order to maintain full employment and this is a one of my favorite quotes of hers on the theory of distribution it is at the points where the theory breaks down that it begins to become interesting because she saying all of this is a very abstract concept what you need to study are in, is investment unions monopolies monopsonies technical change etc all of this is just a very abstract concept and the last slide and i will finish this really tells us i mean this helps put the whole debate bit of piketty in a uh, context piketty says inequality will rise with growth summers lawrence summers uh, matt wrongly devesh rawal all of them are basically saying this can happen only if sigma is greater than 1 we have measured the value of sigma and to show that it is less than 1 therefore it cannot happen now if we take robinson's idea that sigma expresses a potentiality the debate over piketty's capital essentially boils down to saying inequality will rise only if conditions are conducive to rising profit shares it explains nothing the idea that piketty is wrong because sigma has to be greater than 1 is essentially saying piketty assumes that conditions in the future will be conducive to rising profits but what gives those rising profits how are unions changing how is technical change changing what is the behavior of your capitalist with respects to investment now just the second point is just because sigma has been measured to be lesser than 1 before doesn't mean it will be the same in the future if you have a production function that remains the same throughout then you can say sigma is measured in 1980 will be the same as in 2030 but if sigma is reflecting social changes then the social world that existed before 1990s is not the same now in the in the post world war 2 world in developed developed economies for certain social classes you had certain social and technological structures that kept output per head rising that kept real wages rising with output per head that maintain that kept a limit on the rate of profit that's not true now now we have a very weak global labor movement we have immense challenge technical challenges with automation with uh, big tech with technological change we have new market structures that give rise to monopolies and monopsonies all of this will play an impact and therefore you cannot assume that this elasticity of substitution will remain constant as it was then and now because it expresses a, a potential we need to turn our head towards what this potential is and how these social structures are changing so i will end it here that uh, hopefully i have not confused you more than uh, enlighten people on like this concept and my aim was basically to show how this textbook concept is provides a very reductive and restrictive view of what inequality actually is and how it is it is a very interesting aspect that i don't think many people have uh, i mean i don't think is as known that even though john robinson provided an incredible amount provided basically the foundations of textbook mainstream distribution theory she actually provided us a way to attack it as well and i think that really makes a difference because she is the one who conceptualizes it so she knows it and therefore we have to take her criticisms of it in equal measure 
and her writings in the keynesian theory of distribution provides a more richer aspect of looking into what exactly affects inequality in a modern capitalist economy i'll stop there i apologize to the chair if i've taken uh, more time thank you everyone uh, i look forward to continuing this discussion after these sessions thank you thank you rahul and i uh... i think once again along with of course uh, what you've done brought out a lot of things that need to be thought about when we designing curriculum as well related to what meeta said as well again the importance of social structures historical context and uh, also how uh, you know using mainstream theory to critique it and it was great to hear john robinson's name which we don't even hear in classrooms these days even in a uh, like an ma program The next presentation is uh, Alex Alex Thomas, uh, who's recently also written a book on a textbook on macroeconomics. So he's talking about plur pluralism in economics, competing views. Alex, uh, thanks uh, Deepa, and uh, thanks to Sonal from the Rethinking uh, uh, Economics India group, and to Ankur for the introduction, and to everyone else who is uh, behind this conference. I think that. at least when i was a student i don't think uh, we had uh, these kinds of conferences where we could share uh, or listen to uh, many of these issues so what i thought i would do for today's uh, presentation given that uh, pluralism uh, is a recurrent theme i i thought i'll try and clarify some of the ways in which we could think about pluralism based on some of the existing uh, ways in which people have looked at it so and i want to begin by talking about the present state of uh, economics and i'm calling it theoretical monism because in curriculum largely today uh, it is only marginalist economics or uh, some i mean rahul mentioned neoclassical economics i'm going to use the term marginalist economics to be a bit more precise uh, so what we generally teach students is the utility theory of value the marginal productivity theory of income distribution some kind of saving and investment are equilibrated through a rate of interest and slightly more advanced versions might deal with new wall race in some kind of intertemporal optimization and within growth it's supply side growth theory and all of them actually cohere very well within marginalist economics and we are not our students are not really exposed to other ways of doing economics but it is not the case that there is no thematic pluralism most curricula have electives or courses on ecological economics in some cases feminist economics economics of identity labor health education etc so when when i think that taking a look at the curriculum today sometimes students uh, feel that there is pluralism because there is thematic pluralism but i want to make a distinction between thematic pluralism and theoretical pluralism and my claim is that we are still in terms of our curricula largely monist when it comes to uh, theory but the important point remains and as many of us practitioners who are here today and students who would be um, reading such research research continues to happen in multiple paradigms so research continues to happen in marxian political economy post keynesian economics feminist political economy and i'm calling it feminist political economy slightly to differentiate it from feminist economics which could also include uh, marginalist ways of engaging with gender so that's why i'm calling it feminist political economy just to make that distinction and research also happens using multiple tools so within heterodox economics broadly people engage in modeling people do textual analysis if you're working in history of economic thought there is econometrics there is more qualitative studies there is case studies all of this happens and there is theoretical pluralism and i mean i want to make this point as well that research continues to happen i have just mentioned a couple of journals here like cambridge journal of economics review of political economy or european journal of history of economic thought where people do continue to publish research in these areas so it's not the case that pluralism is not a facet of knowledge production within economics but the our curricula are still not theoretically plural and i believe i mean these are this is the claim that i'm making i think that this has an adverse effect on future teachers because sometimes uh, one is not able to figure out the intellectual context or who is uh, responding to whom uh, and there are also adverse effects on policy making because again you're just exposed to one way of understanding the world and i think that uh, the heterodox approaches provide a better way of understanding the world 
And there's also adverse effects on knowledge production because what is taught and the curriculum also influences what people then choose to work on for their PhD or plan to work on for their PhD and subsequent career. Sometimes I get this question that uh, it's only because pluralism is a more recent phenomenon. And so the question that I want to just ask and answer here is the following. Was there no uh, theoretical pluralism in the past? And most of us uh, who have engaged with history of economic thought would know that at least in the context of the theory of value, where when Ricardo was writing and Ricardo and JB say differed, although Ricardo accepted Say's law in some way, but in the case of value theory, he was very clear that exchange value is not determined by use value, but by labor. Whereas JB Say argued that exchange value is determined by use value. So this kind of a debate, what maybe in today's language one could call in microeconomics, goes all the way back. And it has continued to happen, and I think it still continues to happen today. But today, if we open a microeconomics textbook by Varian or by Manq, this kind of a debate is completely absent. And I think that this is deeply problematic. Again, to continue with the idea of theoretical pluralism, and if one reads uh, part three of uh, theories of surplus value of Marx, it's very clear that he's engaging with political economy of various kinds, and he distinguishes between what he calls scientific and vulgar political economy. So, and theories of surplus value in some ways, a survey of political economy or economics before Marx. So where he engages with both or various kinds of theoretical positions. And I've just uh, mentioned this uh, Palgrave small dictionary of Marxian economics here because Krishna Bharadwaj has a entry on vulgar economics here where she clarifies what Marx means by a vulgar political economy. Now I want to take a slightly, I mean, uh, different route and bring in critical pedagogy into the discussion. And some of my understanding of this or more of my understanding of this apart from my own teaching has been influenced by the work of Freire and Bell Hooks. And I would recommend the work of Bell Hooks even more than Freire because I think Hooks is much more accessible and this particular book uh, is even more accessible, especially to us teachers. And I think it's also beneficial to students because they view classroom as a space for debate, for engagement, a kind of safe space where we can talk about experiences, different kind of perspectives, and not a kind of not monism in the way that uh, our, most of our curriculum today is organized. And in critical pedagogy, I want to talk a little bit about theory, empirics, and experience. So I think that it's important that when we talk about pluralism, we talk about pluralism in theory. So is it possible for our curricula, in some ways, to engage with marginalist microeconomics or marginalist economics, but also have contending uh, perspectives from classical political economy, Marxian political economy, post-Keynesian economics. Now this can be done maybe in a microeconomics course uh, or it can be done in a macroeconomics course or it can be done by having separate courses on classical and Marxian political economy. I think there are different ways in which this can happen in a curriculum. It's also very important to have pluralism, I think, in empirics, because today there is a particular domination of what I would call microeconometrics, uh, where, or more precisely, development microeconometrics, because most of the PhDs within economics internationally seem to be uh, working on this particular way of looking at economics. But there should be a way in which in the curriculum we are able to value ethnography, we are able to value textual analysis, we're able to value other ways of empirically uh, demonstrating our economic situation. And I think in the classroom, and I think this is where critical pedagogy comes in even more, it's really important that students are able to express their varied experiences. And I mentioned this in this context that my theory might be telling us in class that technology is good for growth. But my own experience might be that a family member has lost a job because of technological progress. So how do I reconcile this thing that theory is telling me, which is often maybe using total factor productivity, there is data for that, but how do I reconcile it with my own experience? And I don't know, we, we have to have a way of at least having a space for talking about these contending uh, perspectives. 
I want to talk about the way in which people have approached pluralism. Uh, and I'm just calling them, I mean, I'm, anti pluralism is a, maybe a bit too harsh and a bit too strong, but just for purposes of, uh, I think, presentation, it's okay. So, broadly, I, I've identified three ways in which pluralism has been understood or engaged with. One is a kind of anti pluralist standpoint, the other is pluralism by synthesis, and the third, I'm calling it pluralism by antithesis. The people who are sort of anti pluralist seem to suggest that don't introduce pluralism because it confuses students. And to me, I don't think this is a sufficient argument because there's also a paternalist kind of element here that we are saying that you're not yet ready to think, you're not yet ready to debate and understand contending standpoints. Some people also argue that if you have pluralism, it makes economics less credible as a science. Again, this is not satisfactory because science itself has multiple approaches and there is pluralism in science too, and what is the scientific method? There are different kinds of debates, both in philosophy of science and in science about what science and different approaches to science. And maybe this is a more commonly uh, understood way of anti-pluralism, which is that marginalism is the only economics and there is no other kind of economics. And this is the impression that one gets if I were to pick up Q or someone else. Pluralism by synthesis is a slightly different way of going about it. Uh, and I think that at least for an introductory courses or for a bachelor's program, I believe that pluralism by synthesis, that is you bring in A, B and C who might be working in different paradigms together. But I believe that this has to be done only after the student is exposed to what these individuals are actually talking about. And in that sense, I find it slight, intellectually slightly problematic because it is not clear whether I'm going with the fundamental views of Keynes, I'm going with the fundamental views of Hayek, or I'm go, am I going with the fundamental views of Samuelson or Marshall? And I think that pedagogically it becomes tiresome because uh, when teaching it, we are not sure, again, for the same reason, uh, how do these different you know, strange or strange people fit in together? So it can become a little bit difficult when we are trying to do this at an early stage. Uh, and this is some, uh, a, a, uh, an example that I often give that some people think that it's okay to synthesize Ambedkar and Gandhi. And some people think it's not okay to synthesize Ambedkar and Gandhi. And if I were to take this analogy to economics, one can ask the question, is it possible meaningfully and satisfactorily to combine, let's say the economics of Marshall and the economics of uh, Marx, or is it possible to combine the economics of Hayek and the economics of Keynes? And these are questions uh, that I think we need to ask. Uh, and I'm, I'm not providing an answer, but my own position on this is that I think that we have to uh, engage more with pluralism by antithesis. And what are the features of that where we highlight the core conceptual differences between, let's say, Hayek, uh, Keynes, Marx, and also to argue that there are different levels of analysis, that in some cases you might choose a macroeconomic analysis, in some cases you might want to do a input output, or in some cases you might want to do a micro-based analysis. And this also clarifies the nature of assumptions and how distinct they are, say in the work of Marx, in the work of Hayek, or in the work of Keynes. And I want to give some examples from the history of economic thought where you can find this kind of pluralism by synthesis. And I think that intentionally, for Marshall at least, Marshall wants to synthesize classical political economy and marginalist economics. So Marshall wants to synthesize Smith-Ricardo on one hand and Jevons, Walrus, and Menger on the other hand. Samuelson, in some sense, is also a synthesizer uh, in his uh, economics the famous textbook, he also brings in Keynesian elements into it. Uh, I think that unsuccessful in some ways, uh, maybe he has been successful in other ways, is I think, uh, and it's also not very intentional in the case of Keynes because Keynes is trying to run away from Marshall, but still he has a lot of Marshallian elements in his general theory. And I think it's owing to this, that now we have neo-Keynesian economics, post-Keynesian economics, new Keynesian economics, and post-Keynesian economics say that what you're saying is wrong and vice versa. So there are debates about what Keynes really meant and how to interpret Keynes. And part of it really is because I think 
he has been unsuccessful in trying to get away from Marshall's uh, Marshallian elements in his work. Pluralism by antithesis, I would say, is people like Marx, who is making a clear distinction between vulgar political economy and scientific political economy. Economists like Piero Strafa, again, who is making a distinction between marginalist economics and classical political economy. And Krishna Bharadwaj, who is also writing in the same tradition and making this kind of a clear distinction by the nature of assumptions, the methodological implications, and the mechanisms involved. Now I want to, so I've just mentioned this book of Krishna Bhardwaj here in case uh, some of you are interested to engage more with her work. I want to give some examples of textbooks, uh, including my own and how they fit in uh, into this broad uh, categorizing that I've done. So anti-pluralism, I, I think it's quite clear that if one looks at the work of Q or Varian, we get the sense that this is the only way to do economics. These are the principles of economics and there is no other way in which people are trying to study economics. Pluralism by synthesis, and I think the most recent example, at least of a textbook, would be the core textbook, and where uh, Sam Bowles and Wendy Carlin say very clearly that what they have tried to do in this textbook is to bring Hayek, Keynes, and Nash together. And I think that this leads to some kind of problems because it is unclear whether the fundamental or the core of the theory is coming from Hayek, or from Keynes, or from Nash, or whether, you know, how, how do we understand this? Uh, pluralism by antithesis, uh, the way in which I've addressed my macroeconomics book is to show that there are differences between two broadly um, marginalist economics and, let's say, Keynesian, classical, uh, Strafian economics. And this book by Petri, which is, uh, uh, which is a much more recent book, or around the same time, and this is an advanced book, I believe, and it's not, I don't think, meant for undergraduate students, but where what Petri does is also that he distinguishes between mainstream and heterodox microeconomics. Because it's very common that in macroeconomics, we hear multiple schools of thought, but we don't hear a similar kind of contending debates within microeconomics. And I've got two more slides and I'll end. Uh, and this I've taken from Lakatos, uh, from the philosophy of science. And I think that maybe the continued orthodoxy of marginalist economics is perhaps can be explained partly by this, because there is a very hard core, which is irrefutable. And it, it does not, I mean, no kind of criticism is able to enter there. And in Rahul's presentation, we heard about the capital theory critique, although the uh, critique really is at the hard core, but we still know that People have continued to extend uh, marginalist economics in various ways such that people continue or you just ch make changes in what Lakatos calls the protective belt. So it comes in as exceptions or add-ons, but really the core of marginalist economics, which is the theory of value and income distribution, says law in some kind, all, and supply-side growth theory all remain uh, very well guarded. And finally, uh, this is the last slide and I'll conclude. I think that what if one goes with anti-pluralism or a curriculum which is anti-pluralist in some ways, we are not exposed to fundamental debates. The kind of debate that could happen with, because of thematic pluralism is that there is econometric, econometric evidence which is given a lot of importance, especially with the increase in computing power and big data. There are talks about mixed results there are debates on whether it has been replicated properly or not, but core fundamental debates don't really happen. Uh, the way in which pluralism by synthesis seems to have an impact on the curriculum and on our perspective on the world is that it is a harmonious affair. We can synthesize, let's say, something like Gandhi and or someone ideas like Gandhi and Ambedkar together, or Keynes and Nash together, or Keynes and Marx together, or Hayek and Marx together. And I think that this is a certain kind of intellectual compromise, which makes me a bit uncomfortable. Uh, pluralism by antithesis engages with fundamental debates and makes it very clear that there are debates, at core debates about how the world works. And I think this is also much more open to critical pedagogy because for instance, within the heterodox tradition, one can explain that technological progress leads to unemployment as Ricardo's uh, work very early on engaged with that. And last two points, 
think that knowledge production has always been theoretically pluralistic. I think that curriculum is a different matter because knowledge, the approval of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge depends on power structures. And depending on who's in power, they get to decide how the curriculum should be made, what kind of journal should be ranked at the top, what kind of university should be ranked at the top. And this is largely because of power structures. So my claim here is that theoretical pluralism has always existed, but the way in which universities and other people who are in power have tried to approve of certain kinds of knowledge and exclude certain kinds of knowledge and how it's been disseminated depends on the power structures. And I think that if we can have a conversation around why certain ideas and thinkers have been excluded, that would be really wonderful. And I think I just want to make one more point that it's really great to see a paper on Ambedkar's economics, uh, given that he wrote two PhD theses in economics and it's hardly ever mentioned in our curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Uh, again, a very interesting comments. I thought the difference you made between theoretical pluralism and thematic pluralism is uh, again quite useful when we think about curriculum and curriculum design and make, making space for pluralism within that. Same with the pluralism by synthesis and antithesis. I think a lot more discussion is needed there as well on what then makes it to a core course and what makes it an elective course, given the power structures that we work within. Uh, we'll move on to the next paper, which is uh, being presented by Sunil. He's talking about teaching uh, tax theory at the undergraduate level. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you can make it full. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you Deepa and thanks to the organizers for giving me a chance to present this paper. Uh, I've been teaching public finance in Delhi University for some time now and these ideas, uh, I mean this paper is based on my experience. Uh, this is a tax theory is actually a very small part of the overall undergraduate syllabus in Delhi University. It's taught as a part of the public economics course. Now if you look at the public economics course, there's a section on taxation and even though it touches on the equity aspects of tax, uh, the discussion largely is on the efficiency aspects of tax. It looks at the distortionary impact of tax. It teaches the students how taxes are distorting. For instance, if you look at commodity tax, commodity taxes forces the consumer to choose a less preferred bundle. Income tax distorts the choice between labor and leisure by levying a tax on income, by reducing the disposable income, uh, you know, income earners tend to increase the leisure and reduce the labor. Similarly, capital taxation reduces savings and discourages risk taking. The syllabus looked at, you know, the, these aspects of taxation. They also try to find out, explain to the students uh, how these inefficiencies can be reduced. Now, the only non-distortionary tax is a lump sum tax, which is discussed in theory, but the, the it, it is discussed, it is dismissed as not practical. The, if you look at the textbooks, the, uh, the examples of lump sum taxation that you find are head tax, where you collect the same amount from everybody, uh, or an age tax, where your tax is levied on the age of the taxpayer. So these taxes, lump, the head tax is clearly regressive, and the age tax can also be regressive. So these are dismissed as not practical. After doing this basic aspects of taxation, the undergraduate syllabus of public finance looks at the optimal taxation. It moves on to the optimal taxation theory. Optimal taxation theory looks at how the we can maxim, uh, how we can achieve a given amount of revenue for the government by minimizing the, the uh, inefficiencies. It looks at optimal commodity tax. Now, if you look at optimal commodity tax, the optimal tax theory tells you that uh, you can bring down inefficiency by levying a high rate of tax on goods whose uh, price elasticity of demand is very low and leaving a low tax on goods with price elasticity of demand is very high. Now you have the Ramsey rule which says that if you have many commodities, uh, levy tax on, uh, on, on levy a high tax on essentials and a low tax on uh, luxury goods. Now I feel that such a tax structure is, uh, is, is not at all helpful in designing a tax structure design in, in unequal societies like ours. 
uh, then you move on to optimal income tax uh, in countries like ours where income inequality is very high we would always desire a progressive income tax structure but the optimal tax theory teaches us that the progressive income tax structure is highly inefficient it is associated with high debt weight loss uh, the question that arises is so basically what it argues is that if you levy a high tax on the richer sections of the population they would reduce their work effort and they would reduce their economic activity and that would lead to inefficiency in the system now the question is does income tax actually reduce labor supply available evidence suggests as is mentioned in this book by manuel says and gabriel zuckman the triumph of injustice they show that there's no evidence to show that a high income tax actually reduces labor supply this even in the united states economy that lone countries like ours moreover even stiglitz argues and uh, says and zuckman also point out that if you look at the higher income sections higher income uh, uh, population you will actually find that large part of those high incomes are earned from exploiting monopoly positions exploiting their control over natural resources or uh, utilizing their access to power their their closeness to power so what uh, stiglitz actually argues is that uh, even if it reduces i mean even if uh, that high tax on high incomes forces them to reduce their economic activity it would actually increase welfare and not reduce welfare the optimal taxation theory then goes on to just look at optimal capital taxation uh, as per theory the optimal capital tax is zero uh, it's argued that if you levy a tax on capital it could reduce uh, you know saving and investment and discourage risk taking uh, but available evidence suggests that there is no evidence to actually sub to to support the hypothesis that capital taxation discourages investment says and zuckman in their work actually look at the us economy during the period 1915 to 2018 and they actually show that in those years when the capital taxation taxation was very high the savings and investment rates in the us was high and it's not the case that when capital taxation was actually brought down uh, savings and investment went up so there is no correlation between high capital taxation and rates of savings and investment moreover as stiglitz points out the share of capital income is higher among the high income group so if you exempt capital income or capital from taxation that would make the tax structure highly regressive now but we teach the optimal taxation theory in delhi university and what do students learn from this theory that we teach in the class uh, what in a society where you have very high degree of inequality what students learn is that an ideal commodity structure is one where you levy a very high right rate of tax on essentials and a low rate a rate of tax on luxuries they are taught that progressive tax structure is inefficient also they are taught that capital should not be taxed because that would harm the long term growth prospects of the economy now all this is consistent with the the role of the state that is envisaged in the paradigm so if you look at the delhi university syllabus uh, in the book hendrix and mises chapter on theories of the public sector that again just touches upon the the developmental role of the state but it it argues that the state has some minimal functions to undertake right uh, guaranteeing property rights law and order defense and so on but beyond that any intervention by the state is an accessory it even talks about excessive state intervention in the economy and attributes that to the vested interests of the bureaucrats or the political class in this context because i feel that this 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 paradigm and that is taught in delhi university doesn't actually help us to understand tax theory understand taxation and relate it with what is happening in our economy so i suggest that there's an alternative model this is a model by kalesky uh, this is the model which he this is from a paper that he had written in 1937 uh, where he looks at puts this taxation in a macroeconomic framework by the way the optimal taxation literature looks at taxation in a micro theoretic framework this model looks at taxation in an in a in a macro framework now the results are entirely different when you put this in a macro framework when you can you consider taxation in in a macro framework uh, kalesky assumes a demand constrained system where capitalists save and workers consume and profit is gross profit is determined by capitalist consumption and rate of interest what kalesky finds is that when you impose a commodity tax of course the, the demand goes up because when the government spends that amount when the government spends a tax the demand goes up but at the same time prices also increase 
prices increase because commodity tax is enters the cost of production. Uh, along with that, what happens is that when demand goes up, nom when prices go up, nominal income rises. When nominal income rises, demand for money increases. Interest rate rises, and that has some adverse impact on investment. So overall output need not rise when you impose a commodity tax. So the effect, according to Kaleski, is stagflationary. Kaleski then moves on to look at the impact of an income tax on capitalist profits. When you levy a tax on capitalist profits, of course, capitalist net profit is, comes down, but the gross profit increases because the overall demand in the economy increases when the government expenditure is increased, when the government spends the tax revenue. Gross profit rises even as net profit comes down. Uh, there could be some reduction in investment. Investment could be depressed because uh, as, as net profit comes down, interest rate also goes up. And that increase in interest rate could have some impact, adverse impact on investment. So overall output need not rise when you levy a tax, income tax on capital profits. So let's see, then moves on to discuss a tax, look at the impact of a tax on capital. What he finds is that uh, when you levy a tax on capital, both gross profit and net profit go up. So overall profitability rises. Interest rate does not rise because net profit is not falling. Uh, and output rises unambiguously. There's an unambiguous increase in output when you levy a tax on capital. So what he shows in that paper is that an increase in government expenditure financed by tax on capital is the best way to provide stimulus to the economy. Now this is in sharp contrast to the result of the optimal tax theory, which shows that uh, optimal ta uh, optimal ta capital taxation should be avoided because it discourages long-term uh, growth. It, it has an adverse impact on long-term growth. So coming to the last slide, uh, no, the micro-theoretic approach, right? When it looks at taxation, uh, you know, the result that we get is that taxation reduces welfare. Taxation brings down our welfare. But when you put it in a macro framework, when you look at it, in the circular flow of income and expenditure, you look at the overall society, you actually find that taxation need not reduce welfare. Even if some people have to pay higher pay taxes, their disposable income could come down. They have to bear the tax burden. Uh, others benefit when the government spends that amount. So when you put it in a macro framework, when you bring in capital, when you bring in government expenditure also into the picture, taxation need not be welfare reducing. It could actually increase welfare in the society. Uh, then, of course, capital taxation is not desirable in the as per the uh, optimal taxation approach. But the uh, Kaleski model suggests that capital taxation is the best way to provide stimulus to the economy. So what I want to argue here is that undergraduates should be exposed to such alternative approaches, right? Otherwise, uh, you know, they would I mean, to, to ensure that they, they get a complete picture about taxation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sunil. Uh, again, a great example of how uh, pluralist traditions within uh, even our mainstream forces can uh, teach something very different. And uh, Kaleski, again, somebody missing from our curriculum completely. Uh, and uh, to have a, a conclusion that increase in government spending financed by tax on capital, that's something that many of our undergrad students uh, are not exposed to at all. Um, and uh, I think for further later discussion, also to build this into what uh, Alex was earlier talking about, uh, the thematic pluralism and uh, theoretical pluralism. So it's not just enough to have a course on public finance, but what is taught there uh, is uh, also uh, a matter for discussion. So we move on to the last uh, presentation uh, in this panel, uh, in this session, uh, which is uh, being presented by Vivek. Uh, he is talking about the economic thought of uh, Baba Sahib, uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Deepa, for uh, inviting me. And let me uh, thank the organizers, uh, Rethinking Economics India Network and Satyavati College for providing me the opportunity uh, to to uh, to uh, interact with you on a topic which is not very common while uh, in the in the economics circle. So as this uh, title of this of this uh, two days event that is reforming economics education in India, pluralistic approach or perspective 
I mean, these suits that um, is my is my uh, screen visible, uh, Deepa? Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, this is uh, actually why I am here because you know that this national education policy 2020 uh, is in progress at University of Delhi, and uh, uh, the Department of Economics at Delhi School of Economics. Uh, basically is in the process of finalizing the papers and trying to be as plural as possible, uh, uh, introducing new papers, because we have these options of, I mean, we have two more semesters now in the UG uh, level, okay? So we have some scope of introducing some new papers, but it is very unfortunate that, uh, I mean, this paper, uh, which was uh, this economic thought of Dr. Bhimra Ambedkar, this is part of the syllabus that we had actually some of us uh, had designed and uh, got rejected in the in the bigger meeting at Delhi School of Economics. So we don't want to be plural. We don't want to be heterodox at all at Delhi School of Economics. This is what I think uh, uh, is coming out. Huh? So uh, and uh, generally we do not see people uh, taking uh, Dr. Ambedkar's name while uh, presenting a paper in seminar, at least in the economic. But uh, thanks to Thomas who, who while talking about pluralism economics, talking about uh, debates on Ambedkar and Gandhi. So uh, let me just begin by uh, uh, giving you some, some uh, logic or rational why Ambedkar uh, should Ambedkar should be taught at undergraduate and postgraduate level, especially in the Department of Economics. We know that uh, uh, in the in the in the in the Department of Political Science there are certain papers in the Department of History, in Law. I mean, people are, are teaching uh, Dr. Ambedkar, are discussing Dr. Ambedkar's ideas, his thoughts, his contributions. But when we talk about when we we come to the economics, we don't talk about Dr. Ambedkar. I mean, many of us even uh, do not know that Dr. Ambedkar was an economist. Well, at least those of us who are studying from uh, Indian universities, I mean, they, we should know, but we don't know. <laughs> Till doing my PhD, I didn't know that uh, Dr. Ambedkar was an economist. So this is very unfortunate. So why he should be taught? Why he should be discussed? Because he had some had some great contributions to the to the to this field to the to the subject, okay. And uh, as uh, mentioned by Thomas, that he did two PhDs in economics. So uh, as we know that in 1913, after after doing graduation from Bombay University, Dr. Ambedkar went to uh, USA for his uh, for his master's degree. I mean economics, and uh, this first. Uh, I mean, the, sorry, not this one. Uh, I'll talk about his, his uh, dissertation, MA dissertation and thesis uh, just, just after this. Actually, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, his contributions as per we had, we had uh, uh, put them in the syllabus. And at the end, I'll also show you the syllabus that we had designed for this University of Delhi, UG level students as, as an optional paper, and that got rejected somehow. So, uh, these small holdings in India and their remedies that he that he wrote for the very first uh, volume of Indian Economic Association Journal in 1918 actually is termed and seen by some Ambedkarite economists as a as a as a contribution pioneering contribution by Dr. Ambedkar in the field of uh, economic development. So they said that this is a model for economic development where the problem of agriculture, problem of small holdings are discussed. Along with that, he is also providing the remedies. Dr. Ambedkar is providing the remedies for uh, the agricultural sector and for overall economic uh, development of the, of the country. And there he is basically trying to argue that, that uh, this debate of consolidation and uh, enlargement and things that, that was going on at that time uh, are fine, but the ultimate solution to the problem of agriculture is the industrialization. So that he is saying in 1918. Okay. Uh, then uh, many of us who are basically uh, talking about heterodox economics and pluralism in economics, we are also talking about, I mean, a new branch of economics has come up called institutional economics. Separately, we are nowadays teaching in universities. So 
annihilation of caste another uh, beautiful contribution by dr ambedkar that he wrote in 1936 this was actually uh, uh, part of his lecture that he wanted to deliver in lahore in 1936 in one of the seminars by jat pat todak mandal or something like that but uh, but he he could not deliver it because people did not allow him to come and deliver so uh, this is this is basically an a, a analysis this is this is basically an economics of a caste system economics of a social system rather so i believe that uh, at if not at graduation level if not at ug level at least uh, if if there is a paper at post graduate level this economics of caste system Uh, should be taught to the students especially for those who are interested to know the indian caste system and its impact and how this caste system is impacting the indian economy and have have been impacting the indian economy somehow or the other in, in and uh, has been uh, basically the hindrance for the for the overall development of the economy so this is not a simply this is not a simple a uh, political document annihilation of caste i am talking about or a sociological document this is economics of 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 caste system where he is basically saying that one or one or one or uh, one or two examples just i, I would like to uh, cite from this that he is saying that this in india we do not follow division of labor rather uh, it is the division of laborers and and movement of people from one to the other occupations are not allowed okay so so i mean uh, which is terming as 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 uh, non scientific okay and uh, also uneconomical okay and great loss to the to the to the to the economy of this uh, country now moving on to uh, his uh, ma and phd works i mean in in colombia while doing his ma he uh, wrote a 46 pages or the uh, thesis or the uh, dissertation on ma called administration and finance of east india company okay uh, that that uh, was basically uh, uh, for for the period from uh, 18 uh, uh, 1800 and uh, uh, 50s to to somewhere around uh, uh, sorry from 1792 to 1857 so this covers a period of period of 65 years and uh, he actually uh, i don't want to go into the detail of this is work but i just want to uh, give you the uh, central idea that was put forward by him in this um, thesis the his central idea that the finances of finances of a country are to be judged from the viewpoint of developmental expenditure and among the developmental expenditure of a country the public works such as uh, roads canals electricity and human development uh, on education and health that is what he is arguing applying on the same criteria he argued that the entire fiscal system of east india company was a flaw and against the interest of of indian economy further uh, taking this study forward and when he uh, is doing his phd completing his phd in 1917 from the same university in usa okay the title becomes the evolution of provincial finance in british finance in british india so this is uh, this again covers uh, the period from uh, almost 1833 to 1921 uh, not 21 actually 1913 okay so uh, here is he is uh, central idea basically was Uh, that he is uh, analyzing the origin and development and 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 arrangement various kind of arrange, arrangement of that time okay uh, regarding the provincial finance at at the, uh, the british in, uh, uh, during the colonial period and uh, he is explaining this in two two phases one he is in the first round he is talking about he, he is taking uh, four decades from 1800 and Uh, 30 to 1870 when uh, more of centralization of power in terms in terms of uh, this this uh, province and union level uh, 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 arrangements were there and later on another five decades from 1870 to 1900 uh, up to 1913 or 1915 where 
well uh, alternative fiscal arrangements uh, were 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 basically in place okay now we know that uh, this even even today his his this phenomenal work on public finance or on provincial finance or central state financial relations is that Uh, give the give the uh, the the uh, GST compensation to the states, okay? And uh, we we changed uh, amended the constitution in order to pave way for this uh, goods and services tax. But this provision of uh, provision of uh, uh, the the distribution of the resources, taxable income, taxable revenues from center and the state were basically of the findings. Uh, and uh, he was he was advocating for more and more decentralization of financial power to the provinces at that time and he made provision for this a, a constitutional provision which we are still uh, uh, practicing through this finance commission okay when he got a chance to 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 uh, to uh, uh, be there in the constituent assembly and draft the constitution of india he he, he made sure that uh, this become a constitutional provision that uh, the uh, in the in the future the governments will be forced to uh, follow okay now uh, another phd that thomas was talking about uh, the second phd or two phd's that dr ambedkar did in economics the second phd he did from uh, london school of economics and politics uh, in 1920 uh, completed in 1923 and uh, mean the title of this was problem of rupee its origin and its solution and this is basically uh, can be seen as a as a contribution by him in the field of monetary economics and uh, this thesis is in two parts basically the first part is a historical review of how the rupee evolved okay indian rupee evolved as a currency for medium of exchange in india and took a period of 120 years okay for evaluating uh, to look at the the changes in the form that took place from colonial in fact before the colonial uh, uh, period started okay the second part is more interesting and technical where he suggested that uh, that what should be an ideal currency system for an for a for an underdeveloped uh, or developing economy like india and see uh, and uh, in the second part, he's also talking about uh, the exchange system that India should uh, uh, follow. And you get evidence while uh, looking at various volumes uh, on writings and speeches of Dr. Ambedkar, you uh, get a sense, you get a, a evidence that uh, even even uh, he he uh, criticized stalwarts like Professor J. M. Keynes. On, on Indian uh, currency system, on Indian exchange system, okay? So Keynes was suggesting gold standard and Ambedkar uh, opposed it before the Royal Commission on uh, currency, okay? And uh, given written evidence on uh, his, his submission, okay, as evidence and uh, said that uh, this is not good for India because this will be inflationary, okay, if gold, uh, Gold, uh, sorry, uh, Keynes wanted uh, was suggest Keynes was suggesting basically gold exchange standard for India, not gold standard, and not only India. He was suggesting it for all the other developing countries because they are poor and they can uh, print more money. Okay, then uh, then uh, they keep as a guarantee. I mean, so uh, his contributions uh, to the field of economics. Uh, as a theoretical contribution, as a practitioner, when he, he, he got a chance to be there as a labor member in the, in the Viceroy's Executive Council, we, in, you, we incorporated all these aspects in the, in the syllabus, okay? So that uh, one gets a complete uh, sense and idea of how Dr. Ambedkar uh, contributed theoretically as a practitioner, as a policymaker uh, in, the, in the field of economics. But unfortunately, uh, that did not happen. The main uh, idea before uh, of, of, of presenting this paper here is basically uh, because this is a group who believe in pluralism and at least it will get some, some uh, 
what I, I should say, uh, light in the coming days in other universities, the people from other universities are, are, are also here. So let me just uh, very, very briefly talk about uh, why he is still relevant, okay? Uh, and his works are still relevant and his contributions are still relevant because uh, of, uh, because uh, if you look at uh, this, even, even today we are talking about making India. I mean, we all know, I mean, we all are in this teaching process of teaching and learning. I mean, we fail to increase the share of manufacturing in the, uh, in the GDP, the missing middle or whatever we call it in, but even hundred years ago, he was, he was, he was arguing for industrialization and whenever he got a chance to be there, he contributed a lot in terms of uh, building infrastructure and making industry happen, but that did not. And his model of this development that I was talking about is small holding talks uh, about this, that industrialization is the solution to the problem of, a problem of Indian agriculture. Then inclusive growth. See, we are fighting, basically, we are struggling for uh, in this area nowadays. And not only uh, the government of India, I mean, if you look at 11th, five year, 12th, five year plan documents, we wanted to uh, inclusive growth. So whom we are including, who, whom we wanted to include, whom basically we, we left behind, okay? So that Dr. Ambedkar, what Dr. Ambedkar talks about equality, liberty, fraternity. I mean, I mean even if you look at the sustainable development goals, uh, uh, goals, then you find that uh, eliminating poverty and bringing equality are there that Dr. Ambedkar had been talking about uh, these things uh, in the last century, okay? Then uh, the economics, of the caste system, we really need to understand. Today, in the national education policy, we are talking about uh, multidisciplinary research. What Dr. Ambedkar did actually throughout his life was that multidisciplinary research. Okay, so he was a trained economist, but he incorporated other political and social uh, elements into his research to come to the conclusion, come to the solution for the economic problems in this country. Okay. Then central state financial relation, as I said, I don't want to uh, repeat it again. Uh, I mean, we are moving towards more and more centralization of economic power since uh, this GST was there, uh, GST was implemented. Now, just very quickly, I'm sorry I, if I'm taking more time. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to uh, show you this, uh, and if you want, I can share with you uh, this, okay? So this is what we basically, is it visible? Okay. Yes, yes. So, okay, this is what was the syllabus that we thought to teach these students. So this was the uh, uh, title, Economic Thought of Dr. Bhim Ambedkar. This was a uh, optional paper. These are the uh, uh, course objectives. I don't want to uh, read line by line, okay? I just want to come to this uh, part. This is unit, sorry. In the unit one, we wanted to uh, discuss his thought on economic system, his, his thought on capitalism and communism in detail, then democratic socialism, state socialism and constitutional state socialism. Okay, Marxism and Buddhism, there's a great debate. He has wrote a book on um, Marx and Buddha. Then uh, economic, his theory on economic development, as I said, of 1918 and theoretical issues very, in various other uh, areas where he intervened and wrote about, about economic planning. He also contributed a lot on the, re, on the reconstruction plan, okay, between 1946, 42 and 46. Then uh, a strategy for economic development, we wanted to uh, talk about this uh, post Second World War economic reconstruction plan, then agrarian relation trend reform that his contribution, uh, his struggle for abolishing Poti system in Maharvatan in Maharashtra. Then uh, between again, while being a member, labor member in the Viceroy's Executive Council, he was given additional power, additional uh, charge of water and power. So he uh, made these policies for India between this period. Then uh, his, his contribution towards 
population labor and employment policy and uh, unit 4 and 5 basically are purely uh, are based on his uh, phd uh, work okay one on public finance and another on uh, indian banking and uh, currency that was problem of rupee and on exchange policy so this is uh, it thank you friends uh, thank you so much thank you thank you vivek uh, for also exposing us to this wide range of work uh, of dr ambedkar within uh, economics itself and i think it is quite a challenge to put together all that in one course which you try to do uh, for delhi university and for sharing that which is a resource that many of us can use uh, if not as a standalone course uh, but to even incorporate different aspects of it in uh, various courses that we uh, design and teach as we go ahead um, we have about 15 minutes left and we have some questions so i think we can um, take a round of i'll read the questions and go in the same order there are uh, some questions which are specifically they mostly specifically addressed uh, to uh, the speakers and uh, some of them alex has already answered but uh, you can expand on those uh, while you're speaking uh, as well so if we go in the same order um, before i go in the order the one question i think on uh, which Alex has answered, but I'll read it again. How do we straddle the rising divergence between mathematically oriented topics and topics that are better understood from a historical perspective? Uh, that's possibly something that everybody can comment if you want to, and definitely Meeta uh, as well. Uh, another question for you, Meeta, is uh, please explain what you meant about the complexities that underlay the drain of wealth. Uh, would you like me to go first, or, or uh, uh, okay? So I, I'll I'll uh, take the drain of wealth uh, quickly first. All all that I meant is that um, you know we we know uh, we think now of the drain of wealth as being much larger than just the home charges, and uh, we know that uh, it was uh, you know there was there's much that was not being counted as the drain of wealth, which actually constituted uh, a drain on the Indian economy. Uh, for example, you know, a whole bunch of uh, monopolies that were created, uh, which uh, in terms of the railways, in terms of coastal shipping, in terms of uh, the way the financial system was organized, in terms of the way the um, banking system was organized, all of which now in hindsight, we can see were extremely extractive processes, right? Uh, which, uh, for example, Ladaba and Nauruji at that point of time, uh, given that he was very close to the process uh, while it was happening would uh, uh, not really talk about, okay? Um, so that's, that's what I meant. I mean, sometimes distance uh, gives you a certain perspective uh, which, which allows for a better uh, interpretation of uh, what's going on. Um, so that's uh, what I meant. On, uh, on uh, this math versus uh, history thing, uh, you know, to me, I, I really think that mathematics is really a tool that economists use, and it has, and you cannot forget that it has enriched the discourse enormously, right? Um, so, uh, but it's, it, when you have to, uh, what I was trying to say is really you have to express yourself in a manner in which your audience will best understand. That is what is very important. And that's a very important part of being an academic and being a teacher. If I'm going to use a language that my students don't understand, then I'm an ineffective teacher. If I'm talking to colleagues who understand mathematics, then I can use mathematics uh, to simplify and enrich my, my work. Okay. Um, so that is it. I mean, if you if you look at the uh, work, and that that's why I mentioned by nature's fail. But if you look at some of the the academic papers of uh, Darren Asmoglu or uh, Jean Tirole or uh, Roland Benabo and, and people, intensely mathematical, and they've used this math for uh, you know, for example, uh, Tirole's work on uh, Bayesian uh, 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 perfect equilibrium and 
uh, you know, all the work on game theory has been enormously theoretically very enriching. And it also um, enriches the, the, uh, the perspective that you have on a whole bunch of historical uh, 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 problems. I mean, for example, um, Akerlof has a paper on the class system, which is very, uh, which is very interesting to to a way of looking at the class system. So it is. Uh, I don't see a dichotomy necessarily there. What I I see is a failure to uh, use the appropriate language in the appropriate place very often. And that creates uh, much of the confusion also. Sorry, that was my two bit. Thank you. Thanks, Meeta. There's also another uh, math question, slightly differently framed, which says, uh, do you think that the increasing mathematization of economics has made it just as inaccessible to the general public, which I think you kind of uh, yeah, well, answer. yeah, it has. It has. I mean, when, when we get very fascinated by our own jargon and we uh, kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, deify our own jargon, I mean, it, it becomes, you know, when you make a fetish out of it, then it becomes a problem. So then you're talking to yourself in an echo chamber and not talking to people who you should be talking to. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, you, Rahul. Uh, there's one direct question. Uh, if real wages are lesser than output, why should there be an increase in investment assuming MPC less than one? How is um, labor market going to react to all these changes? Yeah. Uh, okay. So the first thing is that um, at every point in time, real wages are lesser than output. Um, you know, like as long as there are profits, whether it's a tiny proportion of national income or if it there's or if it's a rising proportion of national income, as long as there are profits, real wages are lesser than output. So, I mean, I just want like just to clarify the question. There's no link between real wages being lesser than output and investment increasing. The two will always happen because investment is creating profits, and if profits are created, it uh, implicitly assumes that real wages are lesser than output. The point is that. How do we assume with mainstream theory assumes that the rise in investment will be perfectly suited to technical conditions and will always maintain full employment, which is what Joan Robinson was critiquing and attacking. If you take a cob, if you assume that the economy is characterized by a Cobb Douglas production function, uh, there is a rise in the capital to labor ratio. There is a rise in output per head. The production function will the production function approach approach assumes that the real wage will always rise in perfect proportion to productivity. Uh, factor shares will remain constant. The amount of investment that is forthcoming will exactly maintain full employment. And what you are asking, how will the labor market react? That is precisely the point which Robinson was saying in that the mainstream theory, all of these questions are pushed to the side because um, assuming that marginal productivity equals the wage rate, we already know what it is supposed to be. The production function approach tells us the conditions that are required to be satisfied to maintain full employment. It doesn't tell us anything whether that will actually happen. And that's what Robinson was always trying to say that you for full employment to be maintained, you require investment to happen this way. You require the labor market to react in a certain way. There is absolutely no uh, necessity for it to actually happen like that. There is absolutely no reason to believe that this is what is going to happen. So she was actually talking like what you were saying, why should investment come in that exact proportion to maintain full employment? Why should workers accept that amount of wage? And her point was, there's no reason for it. There is no reason for that to happen outside of a textbook, which is why she said, uh, which is again, one of my favorite quotes, which is why she said it is when the theory breaks down that it actually becomes even more interesting. Yeah, thanks, Deepa. There was actually a question. I don't see it there anymore on uh, <laughs> something some on technical chain. Question. I also thought I remembered seeing something else, but I can't see it now. Yeah. So if you find yeah. it, we can maybe come back another round. Um, yeah, yeah. Alex, do you want to take any of the questions you answered, but expand on it, like either the difference between neoclassical and marginalism or uh, Straffa and Marx? 
no, I was thinking, I mean, since I already, I thought that I'll uh, try to make my responses brief, but uh, what I could do is, I think Professor Vishak Verma has made some points in the chat, which has not come up in the Q&A, but I'll just, uh, I mean, just respond to it by explaining what those points are. Uh, so I think one of the point that uh, was made is that the engagement of the old marginalist economists, for instance, Samuelson engaging with um, Strafa and Garigani and Passinetti and others in the Cambridge capital controversy suggests that they recognize that there were two broad ways of understanding the world and they were cognizant of this pluralism within theory. And I think it's true that today this kind of uh, theoretical pluralism is absent even in the work of, I think, somebody like Piketty, uh, because I mean, Raoul mentioned Piketty's work. Uh, and even to some extent, I might even go as far as saying, even in the work of Amartya Sen, for instance, if one reads his Uncertain Glory, he is very explicit that, or they are explicit that they adhere to the supply side growth theory. So even there, there is no recognition that there is a post Keynesian uh, theory. And uh, on this point, I would add that when Samuelson's textbook first came out, uh, in some yeah. places, there was yeah, yeah. an engagement. And with, there was an engagement with capital theory. Slowly, it went to the footnote, and I think in the later editions, it completely went out of the book. Uh, and one more person, a marginalist economist, again, very interesting is uh, Koopmans. Uh, Koopmans also has a kind of way of understanding internally what uh, the limitations are of marginalist economics. And the second point I would like to make is, uh, I think Osmania University or universe, uh, other universities in India in the 1970s or 60s, having a pluralist curriculum is very true. But I think this is also true of America and other places earlier where people had to do history of economic thought for their PhD. But over time, uh, this has gone out of maybe fashion. I think fashion is the right word to use because there are other things which are more popular and more exciting for people. So this is not seen to be fashionable anymore. So I think that uh, it would be interesting to look at the curriculum of Allahabad University, Madras University, Osmania University, and other places uh, in the 1970s. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Sunil, there are uh, two questions for you. Um, could you please elaborate on the chain effects, uh, logical reasoning of establishing a correlation between high capital taxation and high investment? How do the geopolitical factors affect the correlation? Is there any specific economic actor which boosts the investment? And the other one, can you please provide the reference to the alternative model you have highlighted in your presentation? That's highly stimulating. Sunil, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, done. Thank you. Uh, regarding the correlation between capital taxation and the investment, uh, what I wanted to point out was that there's no uh, empirical evidence to show that uh, high capital taxation uh, discourages investment. E even in the US, where these theories actually come from, uh, there's a study by uh, Sayes and Zuckman where they point out that uh, in the 1950s and 60s, capital taxation was high, but uh, invest uh, rates of savings and investment were also high. Uh, the rates of capital taxation were brought down in the 1980s, since the 1980s and 2018 onwards, is, uh, you know, capital tax, the rate of capital taxation is below the wage taxation. And they show that uh, even when you brought down the capital taxation, there has not been any increase in savings and investment in Parliament. Now, what they point out is that investment is affected. The, I mean, there are many factors that affect investment, but one of the most important factors is the market size, the profitability. And uh, apart from that, what they actually point out in that book is that uh, regulation is important. Otherwise, you will find high net worth individuals shifting their capital offshore. They will move their capital to other tax havens and so on. So, uh, you know, there's no empirically, there's no evidence to show that. Uh, you know, high capital tax taxation discourages investment. Uh, regarding the reference, uh, this is Kaleski's paper, uh, Theory of Commodity, Income and Capital Taxation. It appears in his collection of papers called Selected Essays in the Dynamics of the Capitalist Economy. It's published by Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, came out in 1971. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, Vivek, I have one question for you. Since, uh, yes, please. Uh, just to do with again what you presented and what I kind of was saying after your presentation in terms of curriculum, um, do you think that uh, of course one could have a course which is on Ambedkar's economic thought, the kind that you uh, designed, 
but to bring ambedkar into uh, the main courses like including readings from ambedkar on say monetary in a course on monetary economics in a course on public finance would that also be another way that we look at it and uh, the other is uh, also the absence of economics of caste as well as a, as a thematic paper you know in most uh, curriculum so don't you do you think these are also uh, ways to pursue yes 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 uh, certainly you are correct that uh, obviously we do actually those uh, who have studied ambedkar and trying to understand dr ambedkar and his contribution to this subject for example when i teach uh, indian economy in uh, to the third year b honors economics students on various occasions i try to i try to share uh, ambedkar's uh, uh, contribution and his uh, idea what ambedkar would do, how ambedkar is relevant in a particular place when we talk about unemployment problem when you talk about inequality problem when you talk about poverty in indian economy i do uh, share uh, uh, i mean ambedkar ambedkar thought on on this so obviously in uh, papers like public finance uh, but the problem is that uh, uh, what dr ambedkar did was uh, basically is a history is a economic history okay so uh, in, i mean obviously you can ha- you can mention him in, you can uh, uh, use his works in uh, pcs and bits somewhere to teaching public finance teaching monetary economics okay but uh, in the in the history of economic thought and there, there should be i mean if we have a, as, as alex was saying that this is not in fashion these days we have stopped teaching economic history in delhi university as a core paper for last 8 uh, 9 years since 2015 when the cbcs was introduced okay so we we are we are not teaching economic history i think there was a paper on economic thought or something they rejected uh, economic thought of dr ambedkar also was rejected in the bigger meeting at delhi school so uh, these are not in fashion but sure i mean there are scope where we can uh, certainly uh, incorporate some uh, readings either uh, directly written by dr ambedkar especially in monetary economics and public finance and also in development economics okay so uh, or uh, there are few good books have come up in last few years okay for example narendra jadhav has been writing he wrote a, uh, in 3 uh, 4 years ago he wrote a book on uh, dr ambedkar and economics uh, extraordinary other than this he also has written uh, so many recently i think in after this pandemic a very good book uh, ambedkar's vision of economic development for india if i if i show you this okay this uh, was published by rutledge okay uh, gumati sridevi where uh, professor thorat uh, contributed uh, professor sudhir thorat uh, professor uh, nancharaya anand uh, teltumbe uh, despande there are various people have contributed good people have worked on this i can uh, as uh, um, uh, prabhat patnaik uh, was saying that uh, recently also professor thorat edited a book on ambedkar retrospect okay so uh, there are good books from where we can uh, incorporate various issues and ambedkar's thinking and thought in in mainstream economics uh, discipline if not uh, di- pro- direct from his works and volumes but other edited books people are contributing as chapters and these are very relevant and people are correlating uh, ambedkar in development in planning in monetary economics in public finance in equality in the caste system where i mean there are various scopes you are you are right uh, deepa uh, there are scope where uh, you we can incorporate dr ambedkar in the, and this will make it more uh, uh, useful this is what i believe as far as i understood and i am happy that for last 7 8 years since 2014 i am apart from my regular uh, teaching of economics and things i am uh, trying to give some time and trying to understand dr ambedkar and uh, reading his works and other people who are writing on dr ambedkar so it's really uh, making me uh, uh, i am i'm really happy and uh, i'm also uh, uh, able to understand the real uh, things and real problems that actually exist 
uh, here. Thank you, Deepa. Thanks. Since we have a few minutes more, just a little, because the organizer said we have to wrap up by uh, 6.10, there's one question which really doesn't have a simple answer and Alex has also answered saying, I don't really know, but I thought that's a good way to end this session also, something that all of us are asking ourselves and the world. I'll just read it out, give about 30 seconds to one minute to each one of you if you want to say anything. Uh, what exactly led to the normalization of mainstream economists themselves, not favoring the teaching of the history or development of their own field of study to their students. Seems like economics is the only subject where such a critical tool to understanding the subject itself is completely neglected. Uh, 30 seconds to one minute to answer this or whatever your closing comments. Same order, Meeta. Well, I uh, really don't, don't know. I think the, the, it's simpler, I think. What, what has happened is that uh, there, there is, as I said, there's a certain sort of uh, path dependence and there's a certain economy of scale. You all begin to speak the same language and this is something that Prabhat Patnaik is also talking about. And then you want to continue to speak the same language. And as the language becomes much more and more complex, you're not uh, accommodating other ways, other idioms, right? So this just becomes the dominant idiom and that's uh, unfortunately what's happening. Uh -huh. Uh, I think it's because economics sees itself as a natural science or as close to a natural science as you can get. So they don't think that there is a need to study how this science developed. Um, like for instance, in an undergraduate uh, physics course, for instance, you won't go, you won't be talking about pre-Newtonian ideas. You may not even be talking about Newtonian ideas when you're talking about Einstein, um, which may or may not work for them. Of course, uh, they also have like a history of science courses, etc. But the reason why economics, I think, uh, sees it is because they think we are a science. What we have established is scientific. We don't necessarily need to study how this has progressed before. So other humanities disciplines are not scientific, so they can afford to do it. There is no need for us to do it. So that's the only explanation that I can come up with, that uh, I can understand why it is that we don't do this. The other, the other argument is extreme arrogance, but I don't want to go into that. So I think this is a. I think economists have this amazing capacity of learning all the law, wrong things from natural science. I mean, these are things exactly. that the sciences should have learned from social sciences to learn their own exactly. history. But exactly. yeah, um, I mean, Alec? for them seeing it as a science is the nicest explanation that I can give. Sorry, I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe I think I agree a little bit with what uh, Rahul is saying and also with what Meeta is saying, but uh, I, I still think that uh, I this could be a research project, a PhD project where somebody really needs to study why this has happened. And that way we get a PhD thesis in history of economic thought and we get a more systematic understanding of perhaps maybe what has happened in the Indian context. Is it directly correlated with what is happening in the American university? So I think that it is, uh, I mean, there is a PhD thesis or many PhD theses uh, worth uh, writing. I agree there. Can I just actually uh, come in because it's also interesting how many of these, uh, uh, you know, frontline theorists in economics uh, in the middle of the 20th century were actually mathematicians. And uh, I think that that is also, uh, uh, I mean, one way or the other influenced the discourse. I mean, if you look at Nash, if you look at uh, Arrow, look at so many of them, many of them were actually mathematicians by training. Sunil? Muted. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, I agree with the other, other speakers, but, but uh, uh, I also believe that it's because uh, the dominant discourse, neoliberal economics doesn't want to engage with history. Just doesn't want to. Yeah. Vivek? Yeah, obviously, uh, I, uh, as Sunil as said, uh, we cannot have disagreements with what uh, all are saying. But at the same time, I think we are moving more towards the market. So what is uh, it is because uh, we want to produce for the market, not for the intellect, intellectual uh, development. That may be the reason uh, that demand supply, uh, who, who, who will get a job, good job in the market is the reason, I think, for this. But we Absolutely. should have a balance. We should have a balance. I 
think in the context of the NAC and all these questions on how does each course contribute to your skill and uh, marketability, whatever those terms are that they use, uh, these questions, of course, become even more challenging. So I'm right bang on time. Thanks a lot to the speakers. Uh, I'm taking the liberty to thank you on behalf of the organizers as well. I thought it was a very enriching session. Lots of ideas for the teachers in the program on how we can push boundaries within our own courses, as well as the students attending on the kind of research that you can consider going ahead. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm handing it back to the coordinator of the session, Ankur. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, uh, speakers. I think this has been a wonderful session. Especially the last question, I think, really got us thinking. And uh, it's very thought-provoking and sad at the same time. So I hope, as Alex says, some PhD student will write upon it and we'll have another session where we can debate and talk about whatever that person has written. So here's to good days ahead. Lots of PhDs coming out of our sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And it's, it's, it's been a great pleasure to host this uh, session too uh, with everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. And yeah, we our session uh, three starts soon. I, I I'll have to remember the time again. I'll have to check okay. in the time again. I think it's six thirty. So, there's a message in the chat which says. Yeah, I'm just going through that. I'm just scrolling up. Yes, yeah, six thirty. So the the attendees and a panelist six thirty is our third session. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Bye.